In case you didn't know, Ruri Khan made a video the other day discussing his belief in the curse of convenience. The idea started because he made a tweet joking that shockproof is a bad decoration. After mulling it over, he came to the belief that it was true and that he wanted to voice his opinions. Throughout the video and at the end, he invites the discussion, so I'm discussing. As a disclaimer and just to preface this video, I personally feel that 36 minutes was way too long and very disorganized. I understand that he was probably speaking raw and without a plan, so I forgive him for that, but his points are brought up, discarded, and then fly back like a boomerang. I'm just going to consolidate his points so that this response is much cleaner and less reactive to the in the moment wording. I'd also like to clarify that what I say here is not indicative of his character, nor am I trying to be rude in the things that I say, no matter how callous it may come off. Let's start by addressing his problem with shockproof and the points that he brings up regarding it. In Ruri Khan's opinion, shockproof is a bad decision because it ruins the mid and post hunt shenanigans he enjoys that come with friendly fire. He believes that friendly fire is a major part of the experience and doesn't want to see it diminished or removed entirely. To make it reasonable, he figures that people are primarily upset because of their DPS output and that players should mind their positioning to avoid it. I'm going to tackle these concepts individually. If you enjoy friendly fire on both the receiving and the giving end, then of course you're going to feel some type of way about its reduction. It's good that you acknowledge that you aren't right and you're just sparking the discussion, but the way you chose to defend your viewpoint of fun was quite lackluster. You might as well have been needlessly expelling hot air by providing examples of your own experience and an Eric's video where friendly fire was the theme. It was meant to be fun, but when unsolicited, people are not going to enjoy it. Like you stated, being tripped is inconvenient, but following it up with the DPS example, that ain't it. The true frustration comes from being unable to play or have your powerful attack snuffed by a teammate who either accidentally stopped you, wasn't conscious of you, or just doesn't care and wants to keep hitting. So let me tell you two things from, I suppose, my personal experience. Griefing is quite rare, but that doesn't invalidate the experiences that people have had. I don't partake in the friendly fire during the post hunt countdown. I prefer to put my efforts in elsewhere by gathering or mining just to make a little extra on the way out. One player I was in a round robin lobby with in GU after a while back just up and decided to start hitting me while I was carving. I figured he was just having fun so I decided to just drop the body and go get some herbs. Yet he kept hitting me. And just me. I went to a different area. He followed. My only guess is that they were upset because I probably flinched them one too many times mid-hunt. Reasonable. It's a one-off experience and I don't care, but to someone else, they may take that mental note and hold on to it a lot longer. My second personal experience comes from playing with my friends. At one point, I was practicing Valor style switch axe with Demon Riot. If you don't know what that is, allow me to explain. If you do know what it is, you can skip to this point here. Valor Style gives you a reduced moveset that unlocks fully once you charge the Valor Gauge to completion. For Switch Axe, the full Valor Gauge Elemental Discharge is not one, but two explosions. Demon Riot makes it so that your attacks don't reduce the Switch Gauge, but it will slowly decrease over time. In essence, an Elemental Discharge loop. In GU, the thrust for an Elemental Discharge and the explosion can both hard knock down allies. Can you imagine why my friends didn't enjoy when I went apeshit, head empty, no thoughts, discharge spamming? Even if I made conscious efforts to avoid them, the recovery effort I make by evading mixed in with the monster moving or them trying to get out of the way inevitably brings them back to me. Again, that's not to say that my experience trumps yours or should be the definitive mentality, but what I'm saying is that your personal experience of having fun may be different from someone else's experience. Friendly Fire does have its benefits, however. In 4, GU, and World, there were times when you could be launched by an ally and not only avoid taking damage, but also get a mount. If an ally was stunned or paralyzed, you wouldn't have to worry about whether or not you can help them, so them reducing the damage reactions is actually something I don't agree with. An interesting point that you made was the reduction of Friendly Fire from certain attacks in the game already, and one of those happened to be Switch Axe. I'm a Switch Axe main, so yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. The upswing was nerfed and no longer allows for launches since base rise. We found this out the hard way when I tried to help a paralyzed friend on the ground only to sit in confusion as I was swinging, hoping to peel his body from off the floor before he got carded. The only damage reaction during Sunbreak was compressed elemental discharge, which no longer hard knockbacks allies. 
You know my friends were having oodles of noodles of fun with that compressed elemental discharge plus switch charger combo. They, they weren't. They were not having fun. Now that Rise is more sword mode oriented than any other game, upward swing losing its damage reaction should have never happened. The discussions surrounding DPS uptime and not being able to play properly are one and the same with different mental states backing them up. Yes, DPS loss is a natural occurrence, if you're constantly getting staggered, and doesn't always have to do with an obsession with damage. I agree, not everyone has to be speedrunners, but in the same vein, if a casual wants to hunt more efficiently, they should be able to do so. To barricade their play with the archaic belief that hammers are head and blades of tail is so detrimental to the general play base at large. One could argue that they should learn to position themselves in order to not inconvenience the other players who are fire dancing around the head, and that's fair to say, but don't force them to adhere to ignorant tradition. I've spoken at length on this topic in a previous video as well as a video series that I've been making for a few months now. I'll go ahead and play excerpts from both of those respectively. Do not compare yourself to other people. This is a double-sided statement, positive and negative. Don't look at other people's talismans and sets and look down on yourself. Talismans are RNG heavy, so you may get lucky, you may not. They may be on PC and decided to alter the talisman. Maybe you're on PC and you wanna be straight laced, but don't feel bad because someone else got a better time or plays better than you because they had a better set or they understand the game more. Learn all that you can from their experiences and apply that to yourself. What did you see that you aren't doing or could learn to do? Things like that. Learn to relish the fact that you can consistently get your times down more than just trying to set the record and it will eventually come to you naturally. On the negative end of the statement, just because you are a speedrunner or you enjoy watching speedruns or abusing the meta sets doesn't mean others have to as well. People play games differently and developers try to appeal to both sides. If you like using offensive heavy sets and someone else prefers to use a comfort set, then there shouldn't be any problem. Both sides have their faults. Someone might not know how to play using an offensive set and make card a couple times. Someone using a comfort set may be using it because they themselves understand that they don't know how to dodge or not get hit, so they sacrifice their damage output for their sustainability. People have plenty of different reasons as to why they do what they do, but unless they're 100% intentionally giving you grief, then you can let the filter go. But some people just need guidance or just want to take the game at their own pace, so please be respectful to others who don't walk the same path as you. My goal is not to teach you how to use the weapons or how to be a speedrunner, but instead instill within you habits that are necessary for improving your individual skill at the game. Knowing how the game works is far more efficient in the long run than trying to copy something you saw on the web. Remember, a meta set does not a good player make. In summary, shockproof, to me, is not problematic whatsoever, and I think it is a huge benefit. It prevents intentional griefing and accidental or careless staggering, no matter how rare that griefing may be. Just like flinch-free, it is completely optional. You do not have to slot it in if you don't want to. I could make the argument that shockproof being level 1 decoration like Defiance is far too strong. It removes the need to even slot in carefully for their compounded counterparts. The real problem is the devs removing damage reactions from weapons. Like me in the 50s, shockproof wasn't even a thought when they were making the decision and it has no real impact on the way that they've most likely already decided to go. This is just a solidification of it and if that's justification for assuming that weapon reactions is going to be removed, I'm going to have to completely disagree with that. Regardless of the reason, it sucks to be stagger locked or thrown mid game and I, like everyone else, should be allowed to deal with it by the choices the game provides us. No choice is a choice as well. On the topic of over optimization, you will be hard pressed to find a game that does not have players who want to go over and beyond, especially since World brought in a new host of people and personalities. Personalities which were compounded by seeing damage numbers and YouTubers making the best sets and highest damage. The blame cannot solely be on DPS nuts. On to the second argument. He claims this section as the curse of convenience. All of the quality of life changes that were made to the game are taken away from the core aspect of what makes Monster Hunter Monster Hunter and it's ruining his sense of immersion. I know I said that I wasn't going to be rude, but I'm going to forego that statement just for this particular point here because the willful ignorance has made my chest hurt. Ruricon states that the feature of accessing your item and equipment chest makes him a sloppy hunter for the reason that restocking takes away from the gathering aspect of Monster Hunter. 
with the option to restock coming with the carelessness of running out of supplies and gathering materials in the field if you forgot to resupply before going into the hunt. This feature made him feel like a sloppy hunter because he would just go off on a quest without resupplying himself. This is what I take issue with. Monster Hunter has changed, but the foundation remains the same. Before going off on a quest, you make sure you have all the items you need and that you eat. Even if we have ender chests for tents, you should still have your business taken care of before you embark. The safety net was not designed for you to intentionally jump into it, but to protect you in case you did happen to fall. I can respect your desire for the survivalist angle as I agree with you, but what I don't respect is you making excuses and a poor one at that. There is no excuse for you becoming sloppy because you were supposed to have had years of experience before this feature was even added. You allowed yourself to passively fall into a bad habit and blamed the convenience offered for your poor behavior. That is no different than someone refusing to learn landmarks or street names because Google Maps exists. You not restocking before entering the quest is a product of your own mental ineptitude and should not be blamed on the game or its features. Now, I will concede, however, and I offer a counterpoint. Preparation is no different in this game than any other, but to add an extra layer to this, if it's still possible, you should be able to restock items from the tent, but not to the extent that we have available right now. There is no feasible way we can talk about immersion without talking about how I can get all of my items and my equipment with me to a tent that can barely fit me and my talking animals. A better solution to this would be to allow full equipment restocking in low rank, but have a much smaller pouch of items and maybe one or two sets that you can prep in high rank and G rank and nothing else. Speaking of immersion, Ruri states that the removal of inconvenient features belies his sense of immersion compared to previous games. Paintballs and temperature drinks being removed, sharpness having more options, and arena quests take away from the hunting aspect. To me, it's no secret that they wanted to appeal to a larger audience as they have explicitly said so. Longtime fans of the series may have had their gripes, but the loyalty to the series deters any sense of questioning for tracking, drinks, and so on and so forth. Everyone was happy when drinks were removed. I mean, it was kind of inconvenient to have to constantly take a drink in order to survive in a particular environment when, in my opinion, the armor that you wear should already be protecting you from said environment. But hey, overheating might be a thing, so kind of have to work on that aspect. For casual players, just getting into the series in today's gaming climate, their goldfish brains won't be able to keep up with actually having to work to find the monster, and so changes had to be made to accommodate them and longtime players. The owl now gives us auto tracker at all points, and let's be real here, what sense of immersion do you get from throwing a paintball at a monster and having their location show up as a pink dot on a map that can move? Joke aside, it may just be nostalgia that clouds your judgment on the aspects that aren't necessarily thought about too deeply. Worlds should have been the type of tracking that's more up your alley, as you have to literally gather prints and other things in order to find the monster with your scout flies. The same logic goes for temperature drinks, unlimited pickaxes and bug nets, whetstones, and so on and so forth. For sharpness, however, there have always been ways to increase your level of sharpness as well as reduce the amount of sharpness that you lose. The condition changes depending on the skill. Razor Sharp is a skill that you simply have to slot in and the issue taken from that is losing slots for other skills. Handicraft gives you more sharpness but is very expensive. Master's Touch requires your set to have a decent amount of affinity to make the 80% worth it. Having full affinity doesn't make you strong automatically as you still have to slot in other skills that aren't just critical eye, weakness exploit, critical boost, maximum might, latent power, and so on and so forth, and you may just end up with diminishing returns if you just full in on affinity. Protective polish requires slots to be taken up and for you to sharpen your weapon. This takes time, and if you want to cut down on that time, you have to get speed sharpening, which takes away slots, eat for dongo polisher, which is a chance to activate and takes away from other foods that you could eat, or using a resource like wet fish, which requires a bit of farming to get enough to consistently use it every quest without worry. Either way, there's a cost to these skills. Heaven Sent is no different. Heaven Sent, like Dereliction, you benefit off of the skill, but there's a massive drawback. Dereliction gives you power in exchange for your life and time on a particular scroll to receive the maximum benefit. Same like Mail of Hellfire, which will get you one shot if you're not paying attention, especially in these higher rank investigations. Not all players can use it effectively as their skill at the game and their knowledge of the monster can hold them back and get them carded quite a lot. Heaven Sent requires you to not be knocked back for a period of time and cannot be acquired outside of Amatsu armor. 
This limits your options, not just as armor, but decoration slots, as you will need to compensate for level two or three decoration slots, and your talisman has to be on point. The benefit of the skill comes from your personal skill, and aspect alone balances the power scale. If you're sloppy or inefficient, you'll end up losing the ability and your sharpness and you'll have to scrounge to make up for it. Maybe you have to swap scrolls when you get there. If you're not good at redirection, you could get annihilated. There's all these caveats that contradict the idea of sharpness just being removed altogether because for these skills to work, for them to be incredibly powerful, they have to have a condition and that condition is always set. And what I do like in Sunbreak and rise is that these conditions they're meaningful there's something you have to adhere to unlike world safi jiva armor where you could just put health restoration on your weapon and you could be fine yes there is blood right in this game however you have to break apart first and the monster health and the monster damage right now is so intense that even if you're using the switch axe and you're grabbing onto a monster it doesn't matter what part you're grabbing onto if they're doing an attack you could potentially die Lastly, Ruri finds the convenience of arena quests for anomaly investigations to not be hunting and getting rid of core fundamentals of Monster Hunter. Arena quests have been a part of Monster Hunter for a long time in the form of Elder Dragons, event quests, special monster fights, and more. I'm a big advocate for arena quests, not just as a TA runner. The way that they were introduced as special arena quests in the world was the only few features of the game that I actually liked. Capturing a monster and allowing you to fight it in the arena? Oh, that's terrific. Only a slim picking of monsters in previous games had quests that took place in the arena. It shouldn't be frowned upon as some glorified mercy killing. It gives you the opportunity to fight the monster in a space that doesn't require you to go through the usual motions of gameplay, which could assist in your ability to hunt certain monsters. It's more intimate in its design, especially when you're fighting multi-monster investigations where two monsters are on the same field at the same time. Your fixation on what's negative is clouding the benefits of anything that these features have to offer. And I hate to say this, anomaly investigation gatherings are random, so when you obtain one, once again, you have the choice of doing that quest. There's always a choice. If you'd like to take on the arena quest, take on the arena quest. If you wanna take on a normal hunt, do the normal hunt. That's the beauty of it. Even if something is more efficient, as long as you are not strong armed into doing it, then you don't have to. There's people like me who are try hard and got to the max level cap of every update in the first few days. If you want to relax and take it slow since you don't care too much about it and still play with your audience, then tell them, hey, I'd like to avoid arena quests for the time being, and I'm certain they'd be down because they're not there for the arena, they're there for you. And your personal time, you can forego the arena quests all you want because it is still your choice at the end of the day. And pay attention to what I just said. It is your choice, just like how it's my choice to play whatever I want, but also stockpile every monster's special investigation in the arena so that I can do TA quests on them eventually. It's your choice. That's what matters the most. And when I say strong-armed, you're not forced to play those quests. They're just there. If the hunting part is so important to you, then I don't know what to tell you. Because to me, Monster Hunter having so many different angles that you can choose to perform these hunts makes it all the better. And the fact that they're trying different things instead of just relying on the same tried and true formula is risky and rewarding at the same time. Why should people have to settle for the classic format? I'm sure as far as immersion goes, there's so many different tactics of hunting available right now in real life. Someone had to go out and get that lion to fight it in the Coliseum. Or bought it, I don't know. It really depends. Somebody probably hunted a lion to get it there. Overall, Monster Hunter is still Monster Hunter. I understand that you missed the old game's formula. It would be remiss of me to lie to you and say that I don't either, but the reality is that some of those features could stand to be left behind just as some new features today could be left behind. My main worry is that you're too hard pressed by your love of what came before to realize the issues and benefits that were presented for the general and longtime audience. Changes had to be made, and I'm glad they weren't too detrimental to the core of Monster Hunter as much as you imply, because at the end of the day, we're not going through a Dino Crisis 3 situation. We're eating good right now. Monster Hunter 6 is probably going to be the best thing ever, as long as it's not World 2. Anyway, I'm back to finishing up this series, so be on the lookout for it, and uh, until next time.